Previously, on our minute-to-minute -minute analysis of the Matrix, Cypher's jealousy has taken control over his actions. He advises Neo to run from the agents and Neo's training in the construct. Now it is time for the traitor to be revealed and for Neo to re-enter the Matrix. Welcome to Matrix Explained. desert of the real. We begin with a close-up to what could be the most delicious looking steak in film history. Interesting that Smith calls Cypher by his blue pill name. Do we have a deal, Mr. Reagan? Mr. Reagan. Agent Smith never calls the red pills by their true name, as Smith always called a Neo by his Matrix name, Mr. Anderson. This is because the names Thomas Anderson and Reagan are labels given to them by the simulation. They are more like designations than identities. The names that the Red Pills have symbolizes their freedom to choose for themselves. We know that you've been contacted by a certain individual, a man who calls himself Morpheus. For Smith, Morpheus is not the man's name. He is just someone who calls himself that just like Neo and Cypher, or rather, Mr. Reagan. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. Cypher smoking a cigar symbolizes human indulgence. He wants to return to the comforts of the Matrix and not continue living in a dystopian world. After nine years, you know what I realize? Ignorance is bliss. The melodies of the harp are also symbolic. During those moments, the Matrix is heaven for Cypher. The harp is synonymous with a particular celestial being, an angel. In the Paradise Matrix, the agents looked like angels. They dressed in white and had wings. As we've mentioned in a previous video, in the Merovingian's Chateau, there is a painting that symbolizes the machines as angels. The machines will later be represented as beings of pure golden light in the Matrix Revolutions. After the harp sings, if you look closely enough, for a fraction of a second, you can see the other two agents, Brown and Jones' reflections on the window, watching Smith and Cypher, clarifying that Cypher was meeting and making a deal with the agents, not solely with Smith. A common question from our viewers is, how did Cypher connect to the Matrix and meet with the agents without anyone knowing? Cypher modified the ship's computers to make it seem that he was doing something else. Even if someone saw the monitors during or after the fact, no one would have noticed that Cypher met with Smith. Now Cypher didn't connect to the Matrix by himself. Someone had to have logged him in. The crew takes shifts to keep watch or to go on missions. And during one of Cypher's shifts, he already pre-programmed or changed something in the computers so his partner wouldn't have noticed what he was doing. The terms of the deal were for the Zion mainframe codes, but Cypher doesn't know them. However, he can get the man who does. No, I told you I don't know them. I can get you the man who does. Morpheus. Interesting that Smith still calls Morpheus by that name, despite it being a Red Pill's name. Maybe Morpheus is also his Matrix name. Or maybe Smith was just pressuring Cypher to betray him. We now transition from eating a steak dinner at a fine restaurant to consuming protein paste at the mess hall of the Nebuchadnezzar. Here you go, buddy. Breakfast of champions. A stark contrast between the two worlds, validating Cypher's desire to not have to consume fake protein soup ever again. How do the machines really know what tasty wheat tasted like, huh? Maybe they got it wrong. Maybe what I think tasty wheat tasted like actually tasted like uh, oatmeal or, uh, or tuna fish. Mouse's comments connect to the story of the first inhabitants of Zion about a group of people who grew wheat and baked bread in the real world. For them, the taste of real bread was incredible. Nothing like it was in the Matrix. That revelation motivated them to continue fighting against the machines. 
Since the matrix is a lie, so are the flavors of food. This is a reference to the evil genie hypothesis, which proposes that if there is a demon that can deceive our senses, how can we know the truth? Mouse then offers the woman in the red dress to Neo. But if you'd like to meet her, I can arrange a much more personalized meal. You. The digital pimp hard at work. Pay no attention to these hypocrites, Neo. To deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human. To deny our impulses, we are denying what makes us human. Mouse's unique philosophy is known as hedonism. It is a doctrine that considers that the objective or man's sole purpose in life is the search for pure, unadulterated pleasure. This appreciation is not solely based on the affirmation that pleasure is good, but that pleasure is considered as the one true thing or the sole goal. The philosopher Aristippus proposed that physical pleasure should be prioritized over mental pleasure to follow our impulses to be happy. Although, of course, Mouse's proclamations follows in tandem with ciphers. They both shared similar philosophies. Mouse did have the tendencies to betray the crew, to follow his impulses and desires, just like Cypher did. Interestingly enough, this conversation takes place right after Cypher meets with Smith. Though the use of words was different, the message behind them is the same. Morpheus enters the mess to tell the crew that he was taking Neo to meet the Oracle. Tang sits at the controls and loads the crew into the Matrix. This is the first time Neo has returned to the simulation after his awakening. They exit the back of the abandoned hotel where deliveries were made. Cypher is the first to get to the car. Of course, he had a personal reason to be the first to exit the building. Cypher turned on his phone and dumped it in a nearby dumpster. It was to signal the agents that Morpheus was in the Matrix. In the back seat of the moving car, Neo is looking outside the window. He is seeing the reflection of what the real world used to be, similar to when he looked at the mirror earlier in the film and realized that the world was fake after taking the red pill. A reference to another Lewis Carroll novel, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. Another small yet interesting thing is that when Neo says the word God, Trinity responds by saying, what? Almost as if she answers to that name. God. What? This is not a coincidence. The name Trinity comes from Christian theology that proposes that God is a being composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In this case, Neo is the archetype of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. For Jesus, the most important thing is the Father. For Neo, the most important thing becomes Trinity. This is a clever way to represent this metaphysical relationship between them. I have these memories from my life. None of them happened. What does that mean? That the Matrix cannot tell you who you are. But an Oracle can? That's different. This part is also interesting because Neo questions if the Oracle knows who he is, something that he no longer knows. Trinity blindly believes in the Oracle, as does Morpheus. No one knows that she is actually a Matrix program, so Neo was in the right to question who she is. Although he was new to the revelation of the Matrix, questioning the Oracle made Neo more awake than Trinity and Morpheus. Just when Neo asked Trinity about what the Oracle told her, they arrived at their destination. Next time, Neo meets the potentials and finally, the Oracle. Plus, is there a meaning behind what is shown on the living room TV? For Matrix Explained, please leave a like and subscribe. And thank you for visiting the Desert of the Real.